So grab a piece of paper. You should have a paper and a pen in front of you. So I'll explain these <clears throat> games. So there's, there's going to be five things that you're going to write down. So one is everyone in the room is going to pick a number, a whole number, please. No irrational numbers. Um, between one and a hundred. And the winner is going to be the person who gets closest to two-thirds of the average. Okay, so think about that. So everyone in the room is going to pick a number between 1 and 100. So what do you think the average number is going to be, and what do you think two-thirds of that will be? Okay, second question is, you and I are playing rock, paper, scissors. It's your turn. Do you pick rock, paper, or scissors? And what do you think the probability is that you will win? Third game, you're a soccer player. You're kicking a penalty kick. You're stronger kicking with your left foot, or towards the left, rather, but the goalie knows it. Which direction do you kick? Then please write down the last two digits of your phone number. That one should be easy. If you don't know your phone number, someone else's phone number is fine. And the last item is um, it, personal. I have an extra Pony Express phone pad, and I was wondering how much you would pay for it if I were to. If you were going to make a bid on this extra Pony pad I have. Do you guys know what those are? The Pony Express on the iPad thing? They're very, very cool. If you, can't, if you don't know what you would pay for a, a Pony pad, just give me an estimate of what you would pay for an, an iPad. These are the games. So write down your answers, please. Um, don't cheat off of your neighbor or let your neighbor cheat off of you. And we'll wait one or two more minutes and then we will get started, see if we have any guys filter in from the three elevators. Okay, awesome. So let's go back, actually, to the beginning. So hi, everyone. I'm going to do a little self-introduction. My name is Allison Miller. I currently work for Electronic Arts, and you can find me on Twitter at at Selena Kyle. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about uh, game theory, which is an extension of a talk I did here last year that was very well received. I want to thank you guys and Source Boston for inviting me back to talk about this. It's a topic that I find really interesting, fascinating, and still trying to figure out how to get it to apply to my day job and your day job. So, but I've learned a little bit more uh, since we last spoke, and I wanted to share that. <clears throat> oh, and uh, <clears throat> as we're getting started, just want to let folks know, full disclosure, there will be math and econ topics discussed here. So if either of those are going to give you any kind of post-traumatic stress disorder or you're going to have a weird reaction, I will not judge you if you want to take off, but they will be discussed at length. So here's what we're going to, talk, we're going to cover today. First, I'm going to go through a quick review of some game theory concepts just so that everyone is kind of on the same level. A quick show of hands, how many of you have actually studied game theory um, behavioral economics or upper levels of formal logic 
sort of, you've had a little exposure to some of the concepts, maybe maybe you've read some of the, the pop um, econ and math press on the, on the topics. Um, then we're actually going to go through some scenarios and games, because game theory is a way of describing um, how you might predict the output of a game. A scenario set up in a specific way so that you can evaluate and estimate what you think, how you think the game is going to turn out. And while we have some theoretical games we're going to talk about, I also want to talk about what it's like when you try and apply those types of frameworks to the real world. Uh, and then, secrets of irrational economic agents. Um, game theory depends a lot on rational economic agents, but the thing is, is that we are not. So I'm going to talk a little bit about irrationality, and then what that does to these formal frameworks that we, that we have talked about at, at, in the game theory section. And then finally, I want to bring it back around to us, we're InfoSec and risk professionals, and, and how can we apply these tools, which are essentially economic in nature, to designing more secure or lower risk systems. So that's what we're going to cover. And now, you guys were all here on time, so anyone who strolled in late, we're actually going to be playing some games. Did anyone not see this? Okay, you, you're, you're all good. You've picked a number between 1 and 100 that you think will be two-thirds of the average. Um, you've picked whether you're going to play rock, paper, scissors against me. You've decided if you're going to kick right or left. You've written down the last two digits of your phone number, and you've let me know how much you're going to bid on my extra iPad. Okay, so what is game theory? Game theory is actually applied mathematics, uh, and it, is, it studies the decision maker, the decisions that are made by players who are interacting with each other. And there's almost always a competitive element to this. There's some kind of payoff, and depending on the, the strategies employed by the players, that dictates the payoff that they get from playing the game. And the, the competitive element is not necessarily, hey, we're fighting to the death. It's more that the payoff that you receive depends not just on your own preferences and decisions, but on the preferences and decisions of the other people in the game. Um, and so that, that, that brings sort of economics and psychology and math into play, because how do you set up those scenarios and then how do folks make those decisions? Uh, it is not just used in economics, which is where I think folks mainly think about it. It's actually also used in, uh, well, in computer science, but also in military strategy, business. Uh, a lot of times it's a fundamental part of how negotiations are evaluated. If you've ever taken a class on negotiation, thinking about what the person on the other side of the table is going to do is one of the, is, is definitely something that would be um, brought forward and it can be mathematically modeled. It's also used in, in areas like biology because um, uh, na um, so natural selection, wait, what? Come on, Darwin, natural selection, is that, okay, it, there's, a, there's, there's elements to game theory in that. And then here are some of the core economic concepts that are really important when you're thinking about uh, when you're thinking about security or game theory. The first, the first and most important one is utility theory. That's the idea that um, people make decisions because they want to extract some value out of the system. So. Uh, with, when we're talking in economics, often that utility is actually described in dollars as money. But utility could mean something else, too. It could mean you're trying to maximize your happiness, or it could mean that you are trying to, um, you are trying to resolve cognitive dissonance. What, what, what someone actually experiences as utility is personal, but the concept is, is that there is some value, and that's what utility is describing. Then um, externalities are forces, out, forces outside of the game at play that may affect the outcomes. Information asymmetry uh, describes the idea that um, you may have information that your competitor does not and vice versa. And signaling is a way that sometimes those, those types of asymmetries are worked around so that folks can arrive at a best conclusion for both parties even though they don't all have the same information from the start. So, um, but we won't dive too deeply into all the details because otherwise all of our time will be spent 
doing the refresh. So here is when we're when we're discussing games, we would set up scenarios and and describe the strategies available to the player. So player one and player two, in this case this is a symmetric game, so they both have A and B, and then depending on what their choice is and what their competitor's choice is, there is a set of payoffs. So I've color-coded them, um, but usually your row will be on the, the left-hand number and your column will be the right-hand number. And so if player one plays A and player two plays B, these are the payoffs that both will receive. And that's one way that you can set up a scenario as a game and then evaluate it. Another common way that that is done is through decision trees. This particular decision tree shows multiple decisions that are required or multiple strategies that one needs to um, build out in order to arrive to the ultimate payoff. And then um, you may have heard of Prisoner's Dilemma, which is a very famous game. Uh, it talked about a lot by John Nash. If you've seen Beautiful Mind, you know a little bit about John Nash. And that describes a situation where the incentives are perverse, meaning there is a, a good common or an okay common decision, but actually the incentives encourage folks into a worse situ into the worst outcome for the two of them, the worst collective out outcome. Um, there are also... Um, Tragedy of the Commons and Volunteer's Dilemma are relatively similar in the sense that there's some common good, there's some um, common property, but the incentives are such that folks either um, don't want to participate, which limits the utility the entire group can receive, or they want to overconsume the resources to the detriment of the entire group. And then probably you've heard of the concept of mutually assured discretion. Uh, Mutually Assured Destruction, which is another way to describe chicken or brinkmanship, which is you have, you have two folks headed at each other and they're each hoping the other will swerve strategically so that they can capture all of the surplus. Um, and of course, you need to have some credible threats in order to make that work. And usually the outcome is if both folks are very, very highly motivated, they will end up mutually destructing. Okay, and then here is an example of prisoner's dilemma. You see that the best, none of these, none of these is really great. Uh, none of these is really a great outcome because you see no one's really getting a benefit. There's only costs, there's only jail time um, to be negotiated here, but the best collective decision would be if they mutually cooperated and neither ratted each other out, then they would only get one year or one month of time that they have to serve. But if either of them defects from the, the common strategy, if they cheat or they, they, um, they choose to be selfish, then, um, they, then the uh, cost to the person who was good will be great. Um, and so knowing that the competitor has this incentive to, de incentive to defect means, whoa, okay, Skip a few slides there. They're both encouraged to defect, and therefore they end up they end up in the worst collection because they were unable to coordinate. Do 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 do. Okay, so in evaluating the the incentives that folks have to cooperate or defect, we can determine what the most likely outcome is going to be, and then we have a chance. And then we have a chance of predicting what equilibrium is. So equilibrium is a situation, it's a stable outcome. What it means is that both players will select a strategy and neither side has an incentive to defect. Neither side, by independently making a decision, can improve their position. Because if they could independently make a decision to improve their position, they would, and they would defect. So this is, this is described as Nash equilibrium, and pretty much every game has a Nash equilibrium um, where uh, a, stable, a stable solution will be achieved. It won't necessarily be the best collective solution. It's just a stable solution. Folks will not be encouraged to defect. So if we're looking at setting up some kind of problem, competition, or interaction as a game, the first thing to do is figure out who are the, who are the players, then what are the rules, meaning what are the strategies or choices that they have, and then uh, figure out what the payoffs would look like, 
uh, and determine. It's actually important to know whether it's a single shot game or whether it's going to be repeated on an ongoing basis that adds some dynamics to it. And then you lay it out and you can mathematically solve it. So that's how you set up a problem as a game. And then how you win the game is you figure out what the dominant strategies are, meaning, <clears throat> um, meaning, meaning ones that uh, you, would, you would not choose a dominated strategy. You would be, a dominated strategy is one where there's, I don't know how else to describe it, other than to say you wouldn't pick to pay more than you had to. You wouldn't pick to earn less than you had to. You would always make the choice that independently maximizes your own return. So um, those are the dominant strategies. And then when you find the, the intersection of those, that's the equilibrium. And so in order to, the way to win a game is to pursue that equilibrium. It's stable. It's a, it will be the most reliable outcome. And if you're unsatisfied with that, then perhaps you can influence how the game is played itself by, and change the payoffs. So that's where we left things last time. Um, is that we were, we were talking about how, how simple games are won. But actually, in the real world, there's a lot more complexity, especially for someone in the security world. And actually, it turns out that there's game theory games for you, too. So some of the, some of the responses that I have gotten is, well, that's all good. You, you have these ideas that folks are going to maximize your utility, but everyone's out to get me. So how do I model that? What's equilibrium in that? Or, you know, it's, it's, yes, I individually am interested in how secure my system is or what have you, but aren't we all in this together? We're all part of a common infrastructure. We're interdependent and we rely on each other. And then there's the, well, that's a really cute little diagram that she put together with a nice, neat payoff. But the thing is, is that the game that we're in never ends. We're constantly interacting with a never-ending set of competitors, and it's just continuous. So how do we make decisions when that is the case? Because we never get to the terminal node where the payoff is. And then finally, my favorite is, well, what game are we playing? I have no idea what's going on. Okay, well, as it turns out, there's a game for that. So the everyone out to get me, the, the, the tragedy of the defender or the paranoid's paradise, if you will, um, there's, a, there's a way to model games. It's called max min. And basically, you make an assumption going in that the other players are looking for you to get the minimum payoff. So you as the competitor, you're trying to maximize your worst case. Um, so, and, and that's how you roll into that game. If that is the game that you're playing, then there's a strategy for that. And then I'm, you know, and you attackers, you're the min maxers, right? You're trying, you're trying to, you're trying to minimize your competitor's gain as opposed to maximize your own. That's so mean, but it happens sometimes. And one of the, one of the common times it happens is actually in a zero sum game. Meaning, there's no splitting the surplus. You either get it or you don't. So there's, <clears throat> so in that case, naturally, you're both playing sort of min max or max min. Okay. So the, the, so there's a game. There's a game for that. There's also a game when you are playing on a team. So it's a branch of game theory called coalitional game theory. And the idea is that there are multiple participants that need to coordinate in order to, to get an outcome. So instead of modeling an individual's payoffs, you model the team's payoffs. And then the economic part of it, the part where it gets really gritty is, OK, so let's say you have a coalition that is able to get together and go get this, this payoff for the team. Then, then the game dynamics become, well, how do they split it? And there's two schools of thought, and this is, this, if you want more information, we can go into this here, but there's the Shapley value. That one makes sense to me. It's when the payoffs are proportional to what each, uh, what each brought to the coalition, okay? And then there's the core. That one's a little trickier because this is sort of like Nash equilibrium within the agreement of the team, which is, it's, it's um, agents don't have, the agents in the coalition are, are rewarded in such a way that they don't have an incentive to deviate. So um, the core is a little complicated, but essentially um, it, is, it, it takes things like veto power into consideration. So if you, are, if you are a participant in a coalition and you're very powerful, meaning you get to decide what, <laughs> if you don't play, the whole coalition loses, 
then you have a lot of negotiating power when it comes to actually getting the payout in the end. And then, of course, there are repeated games, so the never-ending story, games that go on forever. So, yeah, it's, it can be a little harder to model what the payoffs are going to be because you don't necessarily get to the end and figure out who won. But one good, one good thing about repeated games is that, is that there's ongoing learning that happens. It reduces the information asymmetry between partners, um, not just about what their payoffs and preferences are, but how they're playing the game. So there's, a, there's actually, there's actually a, um, a, uh, a model of a repeated version of, um, let's say, Prisoner's Dilemma. Uh, it, the program is called Tit for Tat, or the strategy is called Tit for Tat. And basically the way Tit for Tat works is, is that you cooperate. You cooperate, cooperate, cooperate. If the other entity, um, if the other entity defects, they defect. And tit for tat is the most successful agent in playing this ongoing version of Prisoner's Dilemma. And you, you sort of see that it's, it's I cooperate, I cooperate, I cooperate until I learn that you're a cheater, in which case I'm going to defect and punish you back. And then, and, then, um, and then there's two ways tit for tat can work. The one that wins the most is the one that I'm going to punish you once, but then I'm going to go back to cooperating. Can we cooperate now and be friends? and continues on that way. Um, the other way is that, it, is that if you, you cooperate, 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 the other entity defects once, you punish forever. You never forget. Um, and so, so those are different ways of playing repeated games. And then when you have that, that can actually be modeled as a mathematical formula, right? And then the payoff is actually a limit, right? A limit, a stigma, as I, you know. OK, so you model it as a limit. You, to figure out what the ultimate payoff is, you just discount it back to present value, like cash flows. Yeah. Okay, so that one's fun. And then the last one is, um, oh, Bayesians, you kill me. So this is the situation where you don't know what game you're playing. So right now what I've got up here is Army 1 is going after Army 2, and Army 1 why there's two diagrams here is because army one is either weak or strong and they don't know which yet and then army two is always weak for army two and so um and then if you think if you're you the description of the game there's a little bit more of a description and i can share it with you if you like but basically they're fighting over an island the island is worth m and the caught co the cost differs depending on whether you're strong or weak so it costs you S if you're strong to go after it and W if you're weak. But then there's no cost if the other doesn't attack because then your armies aren't fighting. You just get the island by default. And so the way, th the way that this works, this is a situation where the game is basically the same, but you can also have a Bayesian game where um, game one is, is something like Prisoner's Dilemma, and game two is something like um, Chicken or Battle of the Sexes, and, and, and you basically just, you, you, ha you get to combine them. So that what ends up happening is there would be, did I do it? No, I didn't. Okay. There's, there, the, the actual, what you would do is you sort of merge the payoff matrices to, to figure out what, um, there's a probability, there's a probability associated with um, your payoff being, your, what your payoff ends up being if you choose right, right. Because Army 2's, Army 2's expected value of the right, right strategy is going to be negative W, but uh, the Army 1's, um, if, let's, let's say it's half and half, because we have a probability. Probability of being weak is P, probability of being strong is 1 minus P. If we say it's 1 half, then um, at right, right, Army 2's, Army 2's expects negative W, and Army 1 expects M minus S minus W divided by 2. And you can actually model it out, even if you don't know what game is being played, as long as you know what the options are of the game is being played. Okay. How are we doing on time? Good. 127? Okay. All right. So... That was really awesome. I'm sure that you guys loved hearing about all these theoretical models, but you're probably wondering to yourself, okay, well, what does this have to do with the world? Because 
Yes? Because army two, it, or army one doesn't really have M minus S minus W divided by two when they decide whether or not they're going to be island. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to look at a real world example right now. So everyone put your hands in the air. We're going to do the two thirds game right now. Come on. You too, you're stretching. Okay, so, um, so if you remember, the game was what would be two thirds of the average. So um, take your hand down if you guessed a number between 80 and 100. Okay, how about if uh, between 60 and 80? How about between 50 and 60? 40 and 50? 30 and 40? So would you say, would you guys say half the hands are down? So we're going to guess that the average guess here was somewhere between 30 and 40. Is that fair? I know it's totally rough, but I don't have time to collect the papers and average. So you, some of you still have your hands up, maybe. Um, how many of you ended up guessing less than 20, less than 10, less than 2? Okay, all right. So, so this is this is this is how we might evaluate this game. So this this one's fun. So we were able to select numbers between one and a hundred. Everyone selected a number between one and a hundred. Now, if everyone selected a number between one and a hundred randomly, if it was evenly distributed, then then what would what would um oh, well first of all, what's two thirds of one hundred? If everyone chose one hundred then two-thirds would be 66. So what's the likelihood that everyone chose 100? Probably low, so maybe we want to get rid of anything that's greater than 66, because for anything above 66 to work, everyone would have had to pick 100. Okay, now let's assume that it was more sort of evenly distributed between 1 and 100, then, then what would two-thirds of that possibly be? Less, less than that, less than 66, right? So you start slicing it off. So then, then um, what, what would you maybe think to get down to the next slice? You might think, well, I just figured that part out and maybe some other folks figured it out too. Okay, so, so maybe you take it down a little bit further and a little further and and the thing about this that's sort of interesting is that if everyone is purely rational and they remove the dominated strategies, so right off the bat, you're removing anything above 66 because everyone would have had to choose 100 in order for, for that to work. Well, why didn't everyone choose 100? Why wasn't that a, a realistic, plausible thing? It's because the other folks in the room are kind of smart too, and maybe they're a little bit rational. But but they weren't totally rational because we didn't stop at one. So when you evaluate a game like this, the first thing that you want to do is you want to figure out, okay, if everyone were rational, how would this work? But then you actually have to think about who else is in the room and think, well, what's the likelihood that they took it all the way down to one? And then if you think, and if you think that the folks who you're playing with are not irrational, that changes your strategy. Okay, which means that when we're thinking about applying game theory to the real world, there's going to be some situations in which things adhere very nicely and some scenarios where things deviate. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. What'd you guys pick? Just shout it out or get your hand up in the air. What'd you pick? You picked some stuff. Okay, awesome. And then what did you estimate was the likelihood you were going to win? Because you didn't know what I was going to pick. So what did you think it was? Huh? Right, one third. That, that was the likelihood that you were going to win. Um, so, okay, well, if we're looking at this game, what's the dominant strategy? Well, the answer is there is no pure strategy that dominates here. This is a zero sum game. And, uh, and actually, um, this is where the Chaos Monkeys piece comes in, which is actually the ideal strategy here incorporates some level of randomization. Why? Because it pays, to be, it pays to be unpredictable. You don't necessarily want your competitors to think that you're purely rational, that you're, well, in some, yes, in some cases you do want them to think that you're purely rational, but in others it just, it's just, if you, if you get a reputation for always playing paper, you're always going to lose. So, 
um, the way to actually maximize your payoff is to mix it up. And, and a mixed strategy is, is what that called. Um, if you have a, uh, elsewise, it's a pure strategy. So, okay, now to the penalty kick, quick, qu penalty kick question. So you're a football player, and you are, you are better kicking to the left, but the goalie knows that. So what did you guys pick? Who picked right? Hands. Who picked go left anyway? Okay, all right. So, the, so if we're looking at a game like football, here's the simple setup. There's no skill here. It's just, this is what, the, if we just assume that um, if you're the kicker and you go right um, and the goalie went left, you're going to make it. Ver and, 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 but if the goalie goes the same direction that you kicked it, they're going to win it. So very, very simple setup. And in this case, there is a, can you guys see this? Or is it too, okay. So in this case, this is, this is just like rock, paper, scissors. The, the way to improve your payoff, if you're the kicker or the goalie, is to randomize. And this is easy, because all the payoffs are basically the same. So they'll randomize it half and half. Just like with rock, paper, scissors, you'd go one third, one third, one third. And, 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 why, and why is that? Um, it, it, they need to be random. If you show a propensity, then the other side is going to take advantage of that. So now I'm going to add in a little bit of skill, which is what we were asking about in our game, which is that, is that you're, you're better on the left. So it's not the goalie totally wins. You're not that bad. But it's, it's, um, it's not as great for you when you play right. So which way do you kick? And given these numbers, um, what we then do is we can't go half and half. Even though there's two different options, we can't go half and half, right? Um, so instead, we have to model out and figure out what are the probabilities that we would split up whether we're going to go right or left so that we are unpredictable. It is unpredictable to our competitor which way we're going to go. And so the way that we do that, the way that we figure out what for the goalie is going to be probability of right versus left and for the kicker, what their cue probability is going to be, is we need to figure out how to make the payoffs, the expected value of the payoffs, the same so that um, they're indifferent. And this was the math slides that I wanted to whiteboard for instead. But I ended up just doing it out for you guys. So the idea here is that, oh, sorry, you can't see the red. OK, so the probability that the kicker is going to play right here um, or sorry, their payoff here is based on what the goalie does. So probability that their payoff would be zero here plus one minus P, the probability of this times their payoff there. And what we want to do is we want to make them indifferent. So we set these two equal and solve for P. So this is what the goalie's probability of going right must be in order to make the kicker indifferent. So even though the goalie's payoffs didn't change that much, it wasn't their skill that that was the issue. They're going to have to adjust their strategy in order to make the kicker adjust their strategy. And likewise, here we want to um, set Q so that the um, goalie is indifferent to their strategy between right and left. And so this is so we get a probability for the goalie of going right, and we get a probability for the kicker of going right. All right. Um, and now, how does this, again, so again, this is a lot of like fun with math, and everyone loves a little bit of algebra in the early afternoon, right, uh, right around 1 p, run to 2 p.m. So how does this map to reality? Okay, so this is real data. This is actual pro soccer players' data and their propensity to go, their, their, their propensity and their win rate when they, go, when they go right versus left versus what the other folks do. And so the kicker is indifferent at a probability of 42% of going right. And the goalie is indifferent at 0.38. And so what we just computed was Nash. We had some real data and we computed the Nash equilibrium. And then we have reality. So um, Ignacio Palacios Huerta did an awesome research paper published in 2003 where he reviewed 1,417 penalty kicks from FIFA games. This is a simplified version of it because we're just looking right left. He actually did right center left. There's the reference if you want to look at the paper. But we compare reality to Nash and we see 
hey, the goalie is dead on. Um, and, the, and the kicker is... So in this case, in the case of professional football, um, reality matches game theory very nicely. Um, and there's some really wonderful explanations of this um, online through Stanford and Yale um, via Coursera and some free, on, free online courses if you want to see a professor explain it in detail. Yeah, question. He's stronger on the left. Yes. So that is one of the really that is one of the really interesting that is one of the really interesting outcomes is that even though the kicker is stronger kicking to the left, when you factor in what folks how folks are then changing their behavior, it actually the equilibrium is they will be kicking to the right more often. So unpredictability pays. So thanks thanks for pointing out. Um, yes, if he was equally strong either way, then, it, well, we would, we, it might depend then if the goalie were equally strong either way, but yeah, if equally strong either way, then probably it's going to be closer to half and half, right? Like in the original game where there was, um, where it was much easier. Okay, so those are professional soccer players. Oh, ten minutes left. Okay. Those are professional soccer players, so what about, what about us? How do we approach our games? And we, and we actually have um, different potential preferences and expectations about payoffs depending on our mindset. So, um, you know, we have folks who are on the attacker side who are a little more mercenary versus those who are looking to maximize the utility associated with some sort of social response um, or uh, care for the the defense of the infrastructure, then you have defender mindset. Some folks are, some folks are risk-based, some folks are compliance-based, but are we rational? Oh, by the way, um, I don't know, I actually would like to take a poll. Do you guys think that persistence is rational? Hands up if you think AP is rational. Cool, because I, I, I'm actually kind of wondering about that, because they reduce the, they reduce the payoff so much through their persistence. But um, but I don't I it would be hard to figure out their utility associated with those payoffs without asking them. So anyway, okay. So and and all right. So we we definitely have payoffs that we want to go after. And um, but but are we rational? And economic studies show what should happen, but what does happen? So um, last time. Last time I was here, we played the ultimatum game where um, player A dollars and they can offer they have to offer a split with player B and player B can either accept or reject and if they reject, neither player gets anything. And so when we played that game, we found that um, player A's end up offering about half, even though a purely economic player B would accept even just a dollar because why not, expected value is positive. Even though if player B was rational, they would accept a dollar, they usually reject if offered less than 30% of whatever the amount was, and it didn't, that didn't vary by culture or by what the ultimate payout was. So when we think about that, we think, okay, well, um, we're not purely rational, because obviously we're taking more than the numeric value of the payoff into consideration, but... Uh, I think that we could argue, actually, that that emotional reaction of unfairness could be factored into our utility function, because our utility isn't just dictated by the dollar amount of the payoff, but potentially some other psychological return. But okay, but we can feel that. We can experience that. We can say, I made that decision not just on the dollar amount, but on the principle. Um, but uh, okay, which, and, and those types of psychological drivers, those are, those are preferences. But certainly, certainly we are rational enough that we wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't be affected by arbitrary external factors, except for the fact that we are. Um, so there are some really interesting concepts in behavioral economics that talk about how we make choices. So you may have read, um, 
Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman or some of the other books on game theory. I'm, I really enjoyed this book by Dan O'Reilly, where they go over some of the ways that our brains get tricked when we make choices. So it's not all about our utility and our preferences because it's actually difficult for us to decipher them. And some examples of that, choice architecture. Okay, a group of European countries, um, half of them have really high organ donation, half of them have low. Is it because of the politics? Is it because of the social values? No, it's because some of them have an opt-in clause for organ donation and some have an opt-out. So the way the choices architect actually changes how people proceed with making a decisions, and they justify it later, whether they opt in or whether they whether they choose to take an action or not, they'll justify their decision later using rationality. But ultimately, it's dictated by their process for making choices. Um, this is an example that you that is a sort of visual illusion, and and Dan argues, Dan really argues that um, our brains have there are similar decision illusions that affect how we end up um, seeing and making choices. So, um, framing, so for example, framing would be an, uh, when we're, if you've ever been trying to make a decision on selecting a fine wine at dinner, you may have heard someone tell you, well, the second, there will be a cheap choice, an expensive choice, and a middle choice. And the middle choice will be marked up the most. Why? Because it's the third option. It's no one wants to be the one who chooses the cheap wine, and the expensive wine looks too expensive. So you think I'll pick the the middle wine because then I won't look like a cheapskate, and it's probably a little bit better than the cheap wine because it's a few dollars higher. That may or may not be true, but it's how we frame our choices um, that that also influences what decisions we make. We may justify it using some some other factors later that seem more rational, but ultimately. That's where we are. And then, hold on. Okay. Okay. So then this is um, the, the last game was what? It was what are the last two digits of your phone number? And the last game was how much would you pay for my um, extra phone pad slash iPad? So I don't have time to survey everyone. But the answer, probably, probably what is true, did you just flash five? Okay, probably what is true is those of you who the last two digits of your phone number were greater than 50, so anyone from 50 to 99, you probably actually gave me a higher estimated price that you would pay me for my um, phone pad or iPad. Why? Well, why, why would you pick a bigger number than the folks who had the last two digits of their phone number be less than 50? And the answer is, even though it's arbitrary, it sets an anchor by which you, th you then take that and you interpret the decision you're going to make without any, without any additional details, you get a sort of a, a false set point. And it's completely arbitrary, it comes from nowhere. So if you want, I can, we can collect the papers and see if that's, that's true. But in other academic studies, it, it has been true when folks have done things like this and people really don't realize it, but those anchors work. And then something to take into consideration for those of us who are in information security and risk is that folks have a marked aversion to loss. So when it comes to taking risk, they, they're happy taking risks when the risks are associated with what they will gain, but they fear more things being taken away. Um, and then um, sort of adding to that are, is the difficulties that we have ourselves in determining what our payoffs are. Meaning it is, it is um, difficult for us to, uh, to the, the concept of money is kind of a strange one. And ultimately money is just an arbitrary thing that gets exchanged for things that we do value. Um, but we have, but there are, there are some limitations in how we think of it that obscure our ability to understand what our true payoffs are or what the true values are that we assign to things. So um, an example of that is uh, we, we have a, a very difficult time determining opportunity cost. So an example is here's a $1,000 stereo um, that you can buy that you like very much 
It's, you like the quality of it, you like the brand, and here's a $700 stereo and, and $300 worth of CDs and music. Well, our brains kind of interrupt there because the difference between a $700 stereo and a $1,000 stereo, in our head, we kind of it sort of, it gets obscured. Oh, it's a little bit more, you know, it's 25%, roughly 25% more or what have you. But then um, we don't think about the fact that that $300 could be used to buy other things. And so, and, and, um, but when it gets framed that way for us, it gives us pause because $300 is actually to our brains relatively meaningless. It's what it could buy that um, affects how we then value the assets that we're looking at. Similarly, I'm just going to skip ahead to pain of paying because I find that one really interesting. Is If any of you have been on, on a budget, self-enforced or otherwise, one of the things tips you often get is pay in cash. Force yourself to take money out of the wall and pay in cash so you know exactly how much you paid versus paying with plastic, just sliding it through, not even really looking at the number on the receipt, right? And actually, studies show that's true. Folks spend more and buy lower quality things uh, depending on the payment instrument that they are using. So um, payment instruments with very low friction you see more of that. You see folks buying more and, and buying things that ultimately they find are lower quality um, because the pain of giving over the cash makes the opportunity cost clearer in their heads. Interesting. So, and then um, Bitcoin, let's not talk about it, but let's just say irrational and also um, what is its value? Um, a question for another time perhaps. So, we come, I'm, I have like 30 seconds left, so we're going to just whip right through this part, but that's okay. Um, so ultimately, if you're trying to, if you're trying to win in, in, a, in a game situation, you still want to, to make choices that maximize payoffs, but payoffs themselves are not so straightforward. It makes it difficult. And so here's my challenging statement, Josh Corman. Risk management is dead because any 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 factor any form of management that requires folks to um, value not just not just um, assets or things that matter to them but assign values to things that are completely risky and could never happen it it it's full of irrationality fun. Um, however long live risk management because that is how that is risk management actually is the application of optimized decision strategy which is which is what we have to work with so if we come back here game theory is a framework for studying decisions when folks are in situations with uncertain payoffs and scarce resources in a competitive situation meaning they're dependent on the strategies of their competitors for their own payoffs and so those situations actually lend themselves well to modeling. Um, um, however, um, however, um, the systems that we design um, need to be ones that enforce decisions. So in security and risk systems in general, they are automated or implied um, decisioning systems. And they and the decisions themselves have an impact that can be measured. Um, for good and bad. So while game theory provides a really great framework for optimizing decision strategy, ultimately winning requires an understanding of behavior, not just preferences, not just probabilities, but actually what has occurred. Um, so therefore, since I'm now over time, um, my recommendation is my recommendation is, is that the sort of theoretical frameworks provided by game theory continue to be augmented by data. Um, and in, so in my research in doing this, I've actually found a lot of pretty formal, formal academic research in the area of information security and game theory. And how's it going? Actually, it's going pretty well because this trend related to applied economics has been really helpful. Um, beforehand, the, there were these sort of theoretical models that assumed rationality. Now that we can um, flex and recognize that there's other factors at play, um, there's more going on than rationality, actually the models I think are becoming better. So the idea is that 
Um, the, be the behavior that is observed provides empirical support for the frameworks, and we're able to now take more into consideration than pure rationality, which was not meeting all of our needs. Are there any questions? Who won? Your, who won? Did anyone win all five games? Not really possible, but how'd you guys do? Yeah, okay. Is that a question in the back, or you want me to remind people to fill in their feedback forms? Feedback forms. Josh, you have a question. Well, um, my opinion is if, the, if you want to try and design the right risk control strategy, that suggests that you are predicting how your attackers or competitors are going to play the game. So I think that what, what this stuff shows me is I'm less interested in why. I'm less interested in why, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm more interested in their behavior than their own internal processing or... Um, what have you, but, but that manifests in behavior. It manifests in the choices that they make to develop their strategies to attack me. And so, um, so I do think that it is important to kind of work backwards because when you just look at the results, you don't necessarily see the subtleties that will help you really predict where they're going to come at you next. Um, and so, and for some systems, since you can't develop the omni layer of security, then you need to tune it based on all the different actors headed your way. All right, thank you guys so much.